Last week, I started a, a series. The title of the series is Living for a Greater Cause. And, and I, I said at the beginning that the purpose of this series is for each of us to begin to discover where we fit in the kingdom of God and what it is that we need to do as we give our lives in service. But I wanted to, I wanted to approach this in such a way that, that you didn't feel guilty. How many of you have ever felt guilted into doing something? A lot of you. I hate it when pastors do that. So I didn't want there to be this sense of guilt. You know, I, I kind of grew up in that kind of society where, you know, I don't need to say anymore. Um, but I do believe, I do believe that the Word of God can prompt some things in us that rather than leading us into service by guilt, He leads us into service by will. And I'd like, if you would, to take your Bible today. I want, the topic of the message today is our concept of God and service. And turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to read the first eight verses and then I'm going to ask that you just kind of keep your Bible open to that because we're going to really begin to unpack the truth of this and what happened in Isaiah's life and how that needs to take place in ours as well. In Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1 through verse 8, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Father, I ask now that you would grant to us guidance because you lead us and guide us into all truth. As we begin to unpack this scripture and see the impact on Isaiah's life and we make application into the culture in which we live, I pray that there would not be anybody left in confusion, but that all of us would be hungry for your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It will come as no surprise to you that recent studies by sociologists, particularly within the last four to five years, have indicated that American culture has grown more and more self-absorbed that we think more and more of ourselves and less and less of others. In fact, it's a trend that has been taking place over the last 50 years, but has particularly accelerated in its recognition over the last few years. That as our living standards in America have been going up, and sometimes enormously going up, there has been a sharp decline in both charitable giving and in volunteerism across the board. And the question that we ask ourselves as we step into the presence of the Lord and the house of the Lord and begin to look at his word is, how can we become less absorbed with our own needs in our own lives? And the answer, I believe, is found in Scripture, and that is to have a genuine encounter with God. A genuine encounter with God. And in this famous passage of Scripture that most of you that have been a believer for any length of time, have probably spent time studying it. From Isaiah, it tells us what it means to have a genuine encounter with the reality of God, that it starts with a God quake. It moves to a self quake that eventually releases us to touch our world. And so the first point that I want to begin with today is a God quake. In the beginning, it says that Isaiah goes into the temple, and this is what is described that he sees. He said, I saw the Lord. Now, I, 
I could preach a series on that alone. I don't know about you, but when I come into the house of the Lord, I'm always grateful that we can lift up our eyes and in the spirit, we can see the Lord. We can see the Lord. He's high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe fills the temple. And what Isaiah is describing here that he sees is he's describing the glory of the Lord. It says the whole earth was filled with his glory. I find that fascinating because when we look through human eyes and we look at the earth around us, we don't necessarily see the glory of the Lord. But there's a spiritual reality above and beyond all of this. And the, the, the presence of God, the glory of God is encompassing everything that happens in our life and in our world. Verse 4, it says, And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, the Hebrew word for glory literally means weight, and that's not W-A-I-T like waiting and patience. It's, it's weight as in the weight of his glory, the heaviness of his glory. And, and other ways that that was described is it's, the glory of God is described as the permanent versus the temporary, or it's, it is the important or most important versus the unimportant, or the real versus that which is illusionary. And when it talks about God's glory, it's talking about the weightiness of his presence. Now, how many of you have experienced in times of worship feeling as if the weight of the embrace of God was just surrounding you and, and you couldn't describe it in physical words? You just felt the weightiness of his glory encompassing you and, and warming you because I believe that probably is a sense of the description of the weightiness of the glory of God. That compared to anything else, God alone is permanent. God alone is real. And compared to anything else, God alone matters. Nothing else matters but God. I wanted to have with me a small child's pool today to do a sermon illustration, but it began to dawn on me that if I did it well, the front row would get drenched. So I need you just to picture this with me. That if we had a kiddie pool here that was filled with water and I had with me a 20 pound, 25 pound brick and I dropped it into the water, that what happens is the weight of the glory of the brick shoots the water everywhere. It causes a quake, it causes ripple effect, it, it, it explodes into the environment that it was there. And when we realize that the weightier the brick that's heavier than water, it causes everything around it to go. And when we realize that the reality of God, when he comes down into our life, the weight of his glory shakes us. It shakes our reality. And it changes everything within your life. This is exactly what we see happening in Isaiah's life when he meets here the glory, the weight of God. In fact, as you go through this, you begin to see that his view of himself, his view of history, and his view of the future instantaneously is changed by this encounter with God. By the way, for those of you that are studiers of Scripture, you will begin to recognize that every time the presence of God came down and met the earth, there was an earthquake. You can read about that in, in Exodus chapter 19 when, when God descended upon Mount Sinai and there's smoke and there's an earthquake and, and it blows up in the presence of God. And, and you can move into the New Testament in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when God came into the upper room. It said that it shook violently because the weight of God's glory is heavier than anything that's found within this earth. In comparison to God, Nothing that we have, nothing that we find on this earth, all of it has no weight in comparison to the reality of God's glory. Now, I'd like to get this across this morning. In fact, listen closely because if you don't get anything out of this, for those of you that are here or those of you that are watching, I want you to understand the difference in these. The difference in having God as a concept and having God as a reality. The difference between believing in God or believing that God exists and actually having an experience with God's glory. You see, when Isaiah walked into the temple, 
It says that he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. I find it interesting that when Isaiah walked in and saw that, he didn't stop and go, oh, there is a God. I didn't know that there was a God because Isaiah had already believed in God. He just never experienced the glory of God. God had been just a concept until this very moment, and then it became a reality to him. And the difference between God as a concept and the difference between that and God as a reality is a matter of glory. Let me explain this to you. God as a concept is lighter than you. God as a concept means that you bring the concept of God into your life and you mold God and you make him fit around what you already believe. You you find that the weight of God to you is something that is, is malleable. And so you build your life around your concept of what you think God should be and how he should operate. In fact, We see this happening all around us because there are people that are constantly today fitting the concept of God around their existing beliefs, around the way they think God should be and the way they think God should understand. But if you do that, you will discover that your God will never shake you. Your God will never quake you. And if you believe in a God that hasn't changed you very much, then I'm here to tell you that your God is merely a concept and you've not experienced his glory. There are a lot of reasons that people believe in God in our world today. There are some that look at the creation of the world and the way that things are ordered and in their scientific mind, they say there must be a God because of the way things work for us. And so they believe in the existence of a creator. They believe in the existence of a God. Some believe that They believe in God because they have an understanding that when this life is over, they want to go to heaven. And so they have fashioned for themselves a belief that everybody is going to go to heaven because uh, we have a God of love and and he would never be a God of judgment. And so they fashion the concept of God around it so that they can feel comfortable about the way they live their life so they can go to heaven. Some believe in God as just a good force in the world that balances out evil. If if we see evil around us, then we need a God that just balances that for us. And then there are those that believe in God and suddenly come running to him when there's nothing else they can do. We saw that on a football field in Buffalo or in Cleveland when suddenly the whole world recognized that in a moment of trouble, they were ready to bring their concept of God in and said, we don't know what else to do, so we need God now. And so we're asking in prayer that you would invade our lives in a way that would bring benefit to us. But basically, we do not believe in God in such a way that the weight of his glory comes in and rearranges our beliefs. We just want a concept of God that lets us believe what we want to believe and fashion it around those things. So here's the way that that plays out for many people. And in the conversations that you have had and and constantly have, we hear it like this. Well, I believe in God. I just don't believe portions of the Bible. Well, I believe in God, but there are aspects of, of what you believe in the Bible that seem so regressive and so oppressive to me that I can't possibly believe that part of God. In other words, our beliefs about our concept of God are shaped by the cultural period in which we live. And we hold culture as the reality and God as moldable rather than the other way around. But right now, we live in a world where our cultural moment seems so real that culture is real and that our cultural beliefs about God's glory have got to be surrounded by what we believe to be true. And so people will say, you know, I can't believe that part of the word, or I can't believe that, or I believe that this passage should be interpreted this way. And if that is what is happening in your life, then you don't have a real God. You have God as a concept. You don't have a God that can actually change your deepest held beliefs. You don't have a God that can contradict you. You don't have a God that can actually change you. You have a concept of God that you fit into you for your benefit. 
and you shape the God concept the way you want, you don't let God's glory shape you. And the God concept not only fits into a pattern of our pre-existing beliefs, but he then fits into our agendas. He then fits into our plans. He then fits into our goals. Listen, there are plenty of people that want to be religious and they want to have a relationship with God for the specific purpose of having God help them achieve their goals. And here's the way that looks. They come and they say, Lord, I need more inspiration or I need more strength because I'm having trouble reaching my goals. And you fit God into your agenda and you ask him to help you reach your personally set goals. And God as a concept will always be lighter than you. But God as a reality will be heavier than you. And when you actually get into the presence of the real God, you discover that everything that you have set up in your life is blown away by his glory. It's shoved to the side by his glory. It is cleaned by his glory. And the things that you have always believed, and some of you believe very, very, very deeply, are changed by his word and changed by his glory because his glory glory is heavier than your beliefs. And he changes the way you think. And instead of trying to fit God into your agenda, God becomes your agenda. And he will drastically change the priorities of your life. You see, our agenda really wrapped up very simply in what most of us probably really desire when we are are asking God for things is this. Lord, I want a safe life, a tidy life, and help me look out for number one. If you'll do that, God, I will praise you for making my life as easy and simple as possible. And God says, when I shake you with my glory, what will emerge from that relationship will be bravery, will be self-sacrifice, will be thinking of others more highly than yourself. God says, I am more real than your individual needs, and I have more weight and more glory than anything on this earth and anything within your plans. And when God in reality comes into your life, all that stuff changes. I'm sure that most of you through the years have seen the video of of a tsunami coming on shore. You see this massive wave of water, and you see people that were on the beach recognizing they're no match, and they begin to run for safety, and as the tsunami hits, it blows away the furniture. It lifts up and pushes away the cars. It smashes buildings and everything when it hits, because it comes in with such force, and, and I believe that that's the picture of us desiring the glory of the Lord, that, Lord, your glory would weigh so much that you would clean everything in its path that the glory of the Lord would come and that it would move everything. So let me conclude this first point by saying this. Every single person who has met God in his glory can remember a time when he went from concept to reality. Has that happened to you? Now, I, I, I would caution you to be careful because some of you are going to go, I've, I did not have an Isaiah experience. I did not walk in and and feel and see the glory of the Lord. Let me me just say that God deals with each of us individually. And he knows how to deal with each of us because nobody else had that experience of Isaiah either. Even Jeremiah had a different experience. In Jeremiah chapter 1, it says you can see where God became a reality to him and called him into service. And Jeremiah 1 and Isaiah 6 described the same encounter, but it looked completely different to both of them. And you know why? Because they were different people. And they needed different things. You see, Isaiah was a proud man. And as a young man, he was one of the elites of his society. And so he enters in thinking highly of himself. Jeremiah, on the other side, grew up with feelings of inferiority. He never felt good enough. And he was always feeling that he can't do anything. So when God shows up in reality to Jeremiah, he tells him to stop trembling. When God shows up to Isaiah, he said, start trembling. But it was the same encounter. He showed up and he changed them forever. One communicator or one commentator made this observation. That what he loved about Isaiah 6 is is that Isaiah, like the rest of us, (laughs) goes into a worship service and he is shocked that God showed up. 
He goes to the temple, and I don't know what he was expecting. I don't know what you expected this morning when you came to church. But it was as if Isaiah said, the last person I ever expected to find in the temple of the Lord was God. Who would have ever thought that I would actually meet God in a worship service? That God was a concept until this moment. And when he showed up in reality, he began to rearrange everything in Isaiah's life. Has that happened to you? Let me ask you this question. Is the Spirit of the Lord contradicting you? Do you allow him? Is he challenging your thoughts? Is he changing you? Has he completely demolished and re-engineered your agenda and the way that you look at life? Because it starts with being in a God quake from the weight of his glory. The second question, how do you know that you have moved from God being just a concept to reality? Secondly, there is a self quake. You might say, well, what, what is that? I think you can find it described in verses five through eight. And here's how you can know that God has become a reality in your life because what Isaiah experienced was three things unfathomable beauty, radical humility, and redeeming purity. It starts with an unfathomable beauty. The scripture says above him were seraphs, and they were calling to one another, filling this room with their conversation. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. Now, in the Hebrew language, Magnitude is often conveyed through doubling or a repetition of a word, and that's something that we don't often see in the English translation. So, for those of you that are familiar with Genesis chapter 14, it talks about people falling into big pits. Now, in the original Hebrew, it doesn't say big pits, it says pit pits. It was the pittiest of pits. Don't know how to describe that. It, it just, it's a pity pit that, that they fell into. And I don't know where your mind's going, but that's, that was the Hebrew interpretation of that. In fact, then you move into 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 15, and it talks about articles being made in English of pure gold, but in Hebrew, the description was they were made of gold gold. In other words, this quality of gold was so pure and was so bright that it was not just ordinary, it was gold gold. Now, I, I don't know how else to describe that except that in Hebrews they wanted you to know that this was magnificent gold. And so we look at this. And so knowing that magnitude is often conveyed by doubling, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible but here is any quality trebled. This is the only place. And this is how important it is. God isn't just holy. He's not just holy, holy. There is a category that goes beyond categories here. God is holy, holy, holy. And we look at that, and the question that we ask ourselves is, what is holiness then? And the Hebrew scholars say that the Hebrew word kadosho means Infinitely unique superlativeness. Now, I had to look that up. Just going to be honest with you. I'm going, what does infinitely unique superlativeness mean? It means that when you say something is super or it goes beyond perfection, it's unique in its superness. Then there's this other side that, that says it's brilliance and beauty beyond what you can imagine. Now, I can understand that one. And so this is what you're getting from the seraphim in this chapter. The seraphim are flying with six wings, and I can't wait to see what they really look like as they're covering their eyes and their feet and they're singing and you can hear them back and forth. And, and, and they're not just saying back and forth to one another, holy or holy, holy. They are holy, 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 constantly in interaction with one another. It's almost in song as they are singing. They are fascinated with his holiness. They can't get enough of his holiness. In fact, once we understand this, then you go to uh, Psalm 96, 9, and you can begin to understand this verse. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Suddenly, the holiness of God, the weight of his glory, changes the way that we worship him and stand within his presence. So what does that mean? Imagine with me for a moment that you have family wealth to your name. 
and somebody comes to you and wants to marry you. And after the wedding, your spouse at some point comes to realize that he or she is not able to get their hands on your family money. And so in discovering that, they look at you and figure out you're not worth living with and they leave you. How would you feel? Violated? Used? A means to an end? Objectified? You would feel that you're not loved for who you are, but just what they could get through association with you. Do you realize that almost all of us relate to God that way? How do you think he feels? When you begin to say to him, Lord, what I really want from you is what you can give me, not just you. You know, you and I have talked to people who have said, I'm so disappointed in the church. I'm so disappointed in God because I went to God and I asked him for all of these things. I, I, I know that he's got this massive blessing bank account. And so I came to him and I received him as my savior for the specific purpose of getting the account number to the blessing bank. And then when I got in a relationship with him and discovered that he wasn't going to give me the account number or the PIN numbers to his account, well, I was so disappointed in him because he let me down. And, and, and he's got this blessing and he wouldn't give it to me. I was looking for something particular and he wouldn't give it to me, so I left God. I've left my relationship with him because it didn't materialize. You married God for his money. He was a means to a preferred end. And in opposite of that, we look in this scripture, and here are the seraphim. And they are adoring God, not on the basis of a cost-benefit analysis. They are serving him just because he is due the worship, just because of the beauty of who he is. And for the seraphim, his holiness was not useful. His holiness was not useful to them. It was just beautiful to them. And if you think about this, how in the world can somebody find holiness the unique superlativeness of God, the beautiful nature of God, how can we find that attractive in itself? Jonathan Edwards points this out. He said, the power of God is something that you and I can get excited about selfishly because it benefits us. The wisdom of God is something that you and I can get excited about selfishly because it can benefit you. You can even get excited about the mercy of God selfishly because we approach it from the idea that I came in guilty and I leave shame-free. He's relieved that of me. I get a benefit from his mercy. But holiness is of no use at all. God's holiness is of no benefit to you. In fact, it is nothing but a threat to us. His perfection in light of who we are humiliates us. It makes us come to realize how far we are away from the perfection of God's grace. And anyone who worships God's holiness is loving God for who he is in himself. So we say, how do you get to that place? Well, let's keep going in the scripture because Isaiah has an experience with God's unfathomable beauty and then it it leads him to a radical humility. Because in verse 5, he says, woe to me, I am ruined. Now, you need to take note that when an Old Testament prophet uses the words woe, he is generally using those in terms of a curse, correction. And so when he uses these words in reference to his own self, and he says, woe to me, in other words, I, I, I command a curse upon myself because in comparison to the holiness of God, I am ruined I'm undone, I am dismantled, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Here's what's happening here. When you find yourself in the presence of human greatness, it often is traumatic because it's a a blow to our self-esteem. So, when I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, we had a young lady that was a phenomenal vocalist. She was the lead in all of our high school productions, and her dream was to go and, and be on Broadway. 
And so after she graduated from college with her music degree, she went to New York City, and, and, and her testimony was, she says, when I got to the place where I was going to audition and I stood near the door, I suddenly began to hear voices that were inaccessibly better than me. And she said, it was a traumatic experience for me to recognize that no matter how good I could be, I, those voices were inaccessible in their ability. And it humbled her. I think of the same thing for great athletes that may come from small towns and suddenly you get on a big campus and you're like, oh my goodness, everybody here on the offensive line is six foot seven, 300 pounds. You know, and, and there's this, these humbling things that take place with, within our lives as we look at that. For Isaiah, Jewish tradition says that Isaiah was from a royal family. Jewish tradition says that his father was the brother to the king. Therefore, Isaiah grew up as one of the elites. And we now know from the book of Isaiah that he was a man of artistic and a man of intellectual and communicative, communicative genius. And remember, he lives in an oral culture. And so as a result of that, he was a man of lips. He was a man of a golden tongue. He was able to communicate at a level that was superior to others. In an oral culture, being able to speak well was power. And now notice in the beginning of the chapter, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now let me give you just a quick history lesson. Uzziah had lived in seclusion for years because he had leprosy. And as a result of that, everything was falling apart. The culture was falling apart. Society was falling apart. And don't you think for a young, bright, intelligent man who could speak well, the idea of the old leaders that couldn't do anything passing away would provide opportunities for the really young and bright to step up and make the changes. And in his mind, he's beginning to think this way. And suddenly he goes from, boy, just wait till I get in power. I'm going to straighten things out, to getting into the presence of the Lord. And suddenly he realizes that everybody else is not the problem. He is the problem. He said, of all my people are unclean, and I am just one of them. Even my lips, the best part of me, is unclean. It's flawed, it's wrong, it's selfish, it's distorted. And every place in the Bible where people move from the place where God is a concept into the place where he is a reality and they encounter the reality of the presence of God, they suddenly recognize that they are sinful. Job said, I heard of you with my ear, but I see you now with my eyes and I repent in dust and ashes. There's a self-hatred of who they thought they were. Isaiah says, woe is me, I am undone. Peter says, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Over and over and over again, this takes place. Folks, we cannot expect to have an encounter with the living God unless we come to the place where we see ourselves as we really are. And that is sinful before a living God in the holiness of his presence. There's no repentance without self-recognition. So here's how you know where you've begun to get into the presence of the real God. You think you're a sinner. You think you're lost. You will see yourself as more cruel, more selfish, more capable of evil, more petty, more small-minded than you ever thought that you were. And you suddenly know that you're a sinner needing to be rescued by the grace of God. And if you don't believe that people should feel sinful, then you only have a concept of God. Because in our culture today, people are saying that the the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, that's not of God. He's never going to make me feel bad. God's love, he's going to build me up. Let me tell you something. You step into the presence of the holiness of God, and you will feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit as he begins to reveal your own life. And if you don't think that people should feel sinful, then you haven't been near God. But that's not all that happens to Isaiah. After this moment where he sees himself as he really is and his self-esteem crashes to the lowest it's ever been, he then is prepared to be transformed by the power of God. And we find this in redeeming purity because as soon as he confesses his sin, as soon as he talks about the reality of his true self and the presence of the holy God, and he says, woe to me, I cried for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. As soon as he confesses his sin, redemption explodes into his life. And here's the way that looks. It says that an angel with tongs 
took a burning coal from the altar of God. Now, in the Old Testament, as you look at the fire of God, you will discover that in just about every instance, the fire of God was for judgment. In other words, he was about to destroy something or somebody when the fire of God came. And here, you have to believe that Isaiah, having been revealed to who he really is in the presence of holiness of God and sees the fire of God that was so holy that the angel couldn't even touch it, had to use tongs, and begins to fly towards him with that, he had to think, I'm a goner. I'm about to be destroyed, and I deserve it because I shouldn't even be in the presence of the Lord. And in that moment... The word of pardon comes and it says, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And suddenly he realized he hasn't been destroyed. He's been cleansed. And God has pardoned him. And then you move from there and worship team, I'm going to ask that you would please come because in the very next verse, he begins to prepare himself to live for a greater cause. After being atoned, verse 8, it says, then, then, after encountering God and recognizing he's not a concept but reality, after the shaking of his holiness, after being personally shaken, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I love the way that God says us in that. In other words, I've got this heavenly enterprise and I'm looking for partners. I'm looking for people that will join me in this because if you'll join me in this, it'll change the world. And instantly, Isaiah, after having experienced the glory of God and the holiness of God, seeing himself as he really is and is pardoned, instantly then desires to go into service, not out of guilt, but out of a response. Suddenly, he's willing to live for a greater cause. One second after Isaiah discovered that he didn't deserve to live, that he was more flawed and more wicked than he'd ever dare believe, he now becomes more affirmed and more valued and wanted than he ever dare hope. Oh, what a God we serve. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to sing. So here's the way we're going to conclude this service today. I'm going to ask that you would stand where you're at, and I want as many of you as can get here just to fill this altar. We're going to sing in conclusion today. We're going to sing about God's holiness. If you're a guest here, come on up. If you can't sing, that's all right. Come on up and just mouth the words. Come on up. I know we're going to fill the altar, fill the aisles. That's all right. You can't hear this word and not respond. His word calls for a response of praise, calls for a response of worship. And if you don't know Jesus while you're coming, why don't you ask him as we're singing to show you his glory? And watch me. Come on all the way up to the front. There's, there's people behind you. Come on up. Come on up. Some of you may get up here and you feel like I just want to kneel at the altar. You can do that. If you want to stand with your arms raised, do that. But let's enter in and let's sing and praise him for the beauty of his holiness.
Some of you need some things that are changed in you today. Hallelujah. 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 There are moments of opportunity that are presented to us where we can move from just being observers of what God wants to accomplish into the participants of what God wants to accomplish. We live in an observing world and we desperately need to stand in the presence of His holiness. We need to worship Him for who He is. The glory of the Lord, the weightiness of His presence rests upon us this morning. We can, we can feel the weight of His glory. And as he does that, I pray that you would let him do whatever he needs to do in your life. If you don't know him as Savior, simply ask him, Lord, would you come in and shake me as your glory enters my life and reveal who I am. And I come to you in, in recognition and ask that you would forgive me, cleanse me like you did, Isaiah, and redirect everything. I do not want a God that I can fashion around my own beliefs. I don't want a concept of God. I want the glory of the real God that transforms me and walks with me and helps me, that can break chains, that can relieve anxiety, that gives direction and peace. That's the real God in the real glory of the Lord. Let's sing that one more time together, shall we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to pray a prayer of dedication over you today. Some of you have made eternity changing decisions. Some of you came into the house of the Lord today, and the last thing that you were expecting was to see God here. Suddenly God shows up begins to address things within your life because he wants to be a real God. And I believe that he's doing a work within you. So Father, as I pray over your people this morning, may we not be satisfied with a God that we can shape. May we not be satisfied with a concept of you that, that we begin to rearrange and mold around our existing beliefs. But like Isaiah, may we step into the presence of a God that is so beautiful and so holy that there is no words to describe it. It's troubled, holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. And in that instance, we recognize who we are and fall before you and recognize how weak, how needy that we are in the middle of that. And then comes the purifying fire of God that redeems us, O oh Lord. And I pray, God, that as that begins to take place within our life, that then after an encounter with the real God, the first thing that we say is, here am I, Lord, send me, because I'm ready to live for a greater cause. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to join you in partnership in the enterprise of your kingdom. 
because nothing else in the world matters except living in the glory and the holiness of God. So, Father, I consecrate your people today. I consecrate our minds. I consecrate our wills. We consecrate who we are and who we think we are. And we lay it in an altar before you and ask that you would redeem and renew and restore and that you would break chains for your glory. And then, Lord, having been in your presence, that you would then release us to service. Father God, I believe with all of my heart that you said that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's going to involve our sons and our daughters and our old men and our old women, Lord, dreaming, visioning together. We know that this is birthed in the presence and the beauty of your holiness. So renew our minds. Help us to rearrange order, to build margins that we need within our lives, O oh God, so that we can live to your glory. Father, settle this in our spirit now, I ask. The word that's been planted, let it just marinate within us as we think of all of the ways that you want to work within us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you feel that you must go, you can make your way out. If you want to stand here for a moment, our worship team is going to continue to lead in this. But I know that some of you are on schedules that have so. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. For those of you that want to just linger for a while, you may do so. And let's continue.